ready to go. Captioner is here, so. I'm also promoting people who belong to DCs, but we're not going to speak. For example, I just promoted Minda just in case if she wanted yeah. to have remarks during the discussion. Um, trying to find any other names. So if any of the panelists um, think that somebody, um, Mariana Franklin, I'm going to promote, still haven't seen Christopher and Smita. Oh yeah, I see Smita now. Thank you so much for pointing me to this. Should be promoted now. And I guess we can start. And once Christopher appears, uh, perhaps uh, Luis can promote him as a panelist because uh, yeah, we, we really have a strict timeline here. Thank you, Luis. Hello, I see that I'm on this in the spotlight right now, but I will uh, right now like kick the ball and give it to Hanan because she would be a leading moderator for this session and she can always count on my help and I will take over sometimes. But right now over to Hanan. Thank you and welcome. Thank you very back. much. Thank you very much, uh, Tatiana. I'm just uh, waiting for uh, the sign that we're ready to go. Uh, it is uh, at least on my clock 12.32 GMT. So if we are ready to go, um, right, okay, well, good afternoon, uh, everyone, and uh, welcome to the main uh, session on the uh, IGF Dynamic uh, Coalition. Um, uh, my name is Hanan Bujemi, and I'll be co-moderating this session with uh, my colleague, uh, Tatiana uh, Tropina. Uh, so the main session uh, of the dynamic uh, coalitions, which is uh, part of the intersessional work of the Internet Governance uh, Forum uh, in its first uh, virtual uh, edition will focus on a theme uh, that is uh, basically close to all of us. Uh, at the moment, we're all uh, battling a global pandemic and uh, it becomes um, evident that the Internet plays a key role uh, in our lives in general. Uh, so this session will uh, focus on um, the socioeconomic recovery after COVID-19 and more specifically the role of dynamic coalitions. So um, without you know, further ado, I'm gonna go through uh, maybe setting the scene for this session, which will include four phases. Uh, each phase um, is uh, focusing on a specific theme. So we have digital divide, uh, fundamental rights and freedom, education and empowerment. And the last one uh, would be the future of uh, the IGF. So this is pretty much a multi-layered uh, discussion because we're trying to identify uh, the future uh, of the internet and its role post pandemic and the role of uh, DCs uh, in, in facilitating the work uh, needed to make sure uh, you know that all the issues at stake are being addressed and we're also seeking uh, the input of the dynamic coalitions with regards to the future of the uh, internet governance uh, forum and the role they can play uh, there as well um, we do have uh, most of the uh, dynamic coalition who submitted substantive papers uh, to contribute to this session represented in the, the panel, um, each uh, speaker will have two minutes uh, to ask specific policy questions. Uh, we do have a timer, myself and uh, my colleague uh, Tatiana, which will be displayed on our uh, iPhone, and I hope you can see it. It's literally two minutes. 
um, the conversation is structured in, a, in an organic way. Um, there is also the opportunity for the attendees uh, to ask questions after each uh, phase. Um, in terms of uh, the format uh, was uh, highlighted earlier by, by the secretariat that this session is broadcasted live on YouTube, uh, on Facebook Live as well, and on the UN channel. Um, this is a webinar format, which means that most of the participants are not able to see uh, who is uh, on the list of the uh, participants uh, in, in this uh, session. But I'm pleased to inform you that we have 87 participants, 52 attendees and 35 technical staff uh, panelists and the support team and translators and the interpreters. Thank you very much. We do have uh, the opportunity that this session is actually interpreted into the main seven languages of the UN. Um, right, so without further ado, I think um, we would like to give maybe the floor to uh, our panelists and uh, maybe I'll kick off uh, by asking one of the key questions on this session is uh, the need, what, what do we need? Obviously, uh, COVID-19 uh, highlighted uh, significantly a number of divides uh, beyond, you know, the, uh, the the usual digital divide that we, we were talking about. So we realize that the internet is crucial, but it came with a with a huge um, disadvantage to a number of communities. And luckily, we do have uh, many DCs uh, representing these communities across uh, the world. So inclusion is crucial um, in this case, and. Um, the, uh, the various devices that we're encountering uh, feeds at the heart of the work that is being uh, done uh, by the Dynamic Coalition, for example, on, on gender. Uh, so I would like to start with Smita, just because um, we tend to uh, give priority to, to access uh, equally to gender, and maybe she can take us through um, what like from your experience and the work that your dynamic coalition is leading at the moment, uh, what are the first priorities that the governments should focus on uh, worldwide when it comes to uh, tackling the issue of uh, gender digital divide in the context of uh, COVID-19? And I'll take the opportunity to remind you that all the sessions, um, the panelists are uh, advised or, you know, uh, it, it is good to, to uh, voluntarily contribute with a policy uh, recommendation uh, towards the issue that you are uh, speaking to so we can uh, gather all this input and present it later on to the secretariat. So um, if you can uh, consider that in your answer, that would be great. So you can speak to now from your experience, uh, what are the uh, first priorities that the government should tackle when it comes to addressing the issue of gender digital divide in the context of COVID-19. Uh, Smita? Thank you, Hanan. I hope I'm audible. Um, I'm having a bit of a power issue here. Uh, thank you for asking this question. And I think uh, it's a very good way to kickstart this conversation, no? because um, in all honesty, till we can guarantee meaningful access to everyone, um, how are we even talking about internet governance and uh, digital spaces and you know, information for that matter. Um, I think in the context of COVID-19, what has happened is that a lot of lived realities, what of a lot of realities around access to digital spaces has just become amplified. And suddenly it's like there's a spotlight on it, right? It's not that these issues came up now. It's just that you're noticing it now. The governments are feeling it, the impact of lack of access, for example, is not only on the people who don't have access, but at a much more macro level, right? Um, for example, uh, we all know that there's, there's a gender uh, gender digital divide. Um, but the thing is that, what is the impact of this, right? Uh, and also, can you really tackle this only at the point of COVID, at the point of a crisis? Um, one of the reasons behind the digital gender divide is not the lack of um, access. Uh, yes, I did participate in last year's uh, We the Internet. Um, yeah, uh, one of the main reasons which has happened is not that they don't have enough mobile phones or that there is not enough data. There is the issue of physical infrastructure, but more importantly, we need to address core issues which kind of govern lack of access, 
right? And the core issues of patriarchy, of um, misogyny, of um, um, you know, language divides, language barriers, all of these are core issues. And, and, and of course, of accessibility for persons um, with disabilities. Without addressing these issues, there is no point of building enough towers or distributing mobile phones or laptops. That has already been done. It didn't work for a reason, right? Um, another thing is that when we talk about the digital gender divide, we often stop the conversation in the binary of gender, right? Um, where we talk about men and women. It's, gender is not just that. We, uh, there's enough and more literature now and enough and more conversations and lived realities which say that gender is not just a spectrum for that matter, it's a whole universe, right? Um, so when we talk about the gender divide, can we really stop in the binary is another question. Um, and what happens when we stop in the binary, right? One of the big issues that was happening and it wasn't acknowledged is that a lot of uh, queer persons in, um, and I know this for a fact in India, um, suddenly lost access to very important medication, um, whether it is HIV positive people who lost access to their medication, whether it is uh, trans persons who were transitioning and lost access to like um, HRT, um, you know, medication. Um, but none of this could be talking, spoken about publicly. This was, um, you know, small organizations which were working to then bridge this divide. Um, and finally, with in a situation like COVID where information is key uh, and a lot of the governments took the route of the internet or apps, you know, uh, so-called apps to track you in as a way to curtail COVID-19. But how will that work when so much, so much of your country is unconnected, when so much of your country doesn't have meaningful access, when so many people in your country don't even have ways to recharge their mobile phones, right? Trans persons in small cities who relied on small mobile shops to recharge. Um, in a matter of a day, there was a lockdown and they lost access to recharge phones. Thank you, um, Thank you right? very much. Thank you. Thank these you. are very, yeah, these are very uh, good points. And I think, uh, I hope we will have the opportunity to come back to you so you can um, uh, maybe elaborate further on the points that you mentioned. I just would like to uh, remind the attendees and we have uh, around 70 people now that we have the opportunity to ask uh, questions and uh, to, to the panelists. Um, but um, uh, you, can, you can use, I think, the Q&A uh, screen uh, that you have on the uh, on, on, on the Zoom window to ask your questions if you have any. Uh, we will try to make this uh, session as interactive as possible. So we, without you know uh, further delays, I, I would just like kindly to ask the panelists to stick to the two minutes. I'm gonna uh, move immediately to Jerry, who's working for the DC on accessibility and disability. To um, to get more of an insight of how you know the the, the COVID nineteen crisis actually highlighted further uh, the the issue that speaks to uh, uh, this uh, DC uh, Jerry. So, what do you think the priorities of the governments should be uh, in the light of the current crisis? Thank you. Uh, as I'm blind, please feel free to give me a twenty or thirty second warning so uh, I don't go over my time. I'm going to answer that, break that question down into two things. One, what are uh, the discriminations that people with disabilities have felt over the last while? And then maybe the advantages of including people with disabilities. And out of that will come what are the policy questions. So first, let's say that there are 1.3 billion people with disabilities in the world. That's about one in seven people or else the entire population of China, the equivalent of the population of China. That's a huge amount of people. As we know that uh, access to uh, just digital services and products give a, a disproportional advantage to those who have strong access to them, but they are a disproportionate barrier to those who don't. This is true for everyone, but particularly for people with disabilities because we typically do not have access to alternatives. COVID-19 related lockdown has moved the whole of society more onto digital uh, areas, but we, we want to highlight some areas where we as people with disabilities frequently don't have access. So there's the inaccessibility of key, uh, key websites, of key services over the internet, including the likes of online shopping sites. And of course, we don't have access to the alternative. Public information, including COVID-19 related information is often created very quickly. So normal accessibility scrutiny doesn't take place and we don't often have access to that. Tools to support education and employment 
are uh, very, very key because if you can't work or you can't get your education during COVID as other people do, then you lose, you lose out and that can be a, give a lifelong disadvantages. People with disabilities are, are often poor and that gives them less access to, uh, to uh, the likes of broadband and the latest and greatest tools, particularly in, in rural, uh, the rural south geographically. Thank you, Jerry. That was the two minutes like on the dot if, uh, if you want to stop there, but you raised some important points about uh, the uh, importance of having accessible uh, websites. Um, I think uh, that is a very uh, good point and I hope that, um, you know, the, the, the different providers, you know, take the lead to adjust uh, their, their, their platforms uh, so uh, people with disabilities can access them. Thank you very much for your contribution. And I'm going to speak to uh, another maybe related topic which can look us a little bit um, uh, in terms of uh, the educational uh, aspects uh, that the uh, public libraries uh, provide, especially in, uh, in an, an era of a, of a pandemic. So Valencia, she is representing the DC uh, on uh, public access in libraries, and maybe she would like to elaborate further on the efforts that uh, they deployed during this time. Um, Valencia, Thank you for joining us. You have two minutes to, uh, you know, put up some light on your work. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, well, for DCPAL, looking at the many different ways that libraries and similar public access facilities have adapted to continue supporting digital inclusion, even when their doors were closed, has pointed to a few possible policy considerations. And for us, actually, we could see these as falling alongside three key elements that empower people to make full and effective use of the internet. That's connectivity, that's skills, and that is content. So in terms of connectivity, one possible consideration is the continued demand for and use of public access facilities across various countries, different measures from boosting library Wi-Fi to laptop and mobile hotspot loans to prioritizing reopening spaces with public Wi-Fi when possible or offering public computer use for essential purposes by appointment during lockdowns. All these are examples of different measures that have been taken to support the to, to, to speak to the demand and help meet users' needs. And these services can be particularly important for groups who are potentially more vulnerable. They are often used for job seeking or applying for state benefits and other essential tasks. And a priority that we would like to draw attention to, of course, is supporting users who may not always have a decent quality connection or the right devices to carry out these tasks, essential tasks at home. The second consideration for meaningful access is indeed, as you have pointed out, digital skills, of course. We have seen some promising examples of how traditional skills programming in libraries can be delivered remotely from Trinidad and Tobago National Library weekly digital information literacy sessions to virtual IT training sessions that libraries in London were able to offer and many, many others. With digital skills clearly essential, uh, a focus and a question and a priority for us is uh, having and supporting entry points to digital skills learning alongside formal educational infrastructures. This can help reach a lot of people, especially adults who may not have access to such learning opportunities elsewhere. And finally, the third element is digital content. In so many countries where connectivity permitted, libraries saw a steep growth in demand for digital content, and they significantly broadened their offer to meet this demand. Digital content has been a key resource for study, research, work, upskilling, and simply well-being during the pandemic. And it can Excellent. support the public. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, very good points, very concise. And uh, I will invite, you know, the attendees to use the Q&A uh, window, please, to ask your questions and take this opportunity to have an interaction with uh, the speakers. I know that we have uh, other DCs represented and I think uh, they can speak to uh, the uh, possible recommendations to governments and what should change actually in the context of uh, COVID-19 when it comes to the specific work they're doing. And we do have uh, June Paris with us from the uh, IRPC um, uh, coalition. And um, I wonder if you have uh, any uh, input with this regard, June. So you have two minutes, thank you. Sorry, um, can you repeat what my input is? So the input is about um, what do you think, you know, based on the work that you're doing at I IRPC, uh, the government should prioritize to guarantee digital inclusion. Okay, I'm representing the IRPC. The IRPC is based on human rights and we focus mainly on 
Article 4 in our charter. And it basically, it's human rights and governments are, are corrected, are connected in a very strong way. I mean, as the world went into lockdown and the online environment took center stage in our life, the full realization of the fundamental rights and freedoms in the virtual space is paramount. Tackling the digital divide is now urgent need as internet access and online participation becomes crucial, being able to work, study, and social engagements. So it is vital to ensure that government responses to the crisis go hand in hand with international human rights and norms so as to fulfill their obligations to promote and uphold fundamental rights and freedoms, both online and offline. Unfortunately, many governments have seen the outbreak as an opportunity to implement more repressive measures from using artificial intelligence, increased surveillance and data collection to restrictions on the freedom of expression and information and discrimination online. We in the IRPC, we are looking at all this and we are covering um, what is going on with COVID and hopefully we, we can make some sort of change in regards to this. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, uh, June, uh, for, for this uh, contribution. And that was uh, two minutes uh, bang on. Uh, we uh, will wrap up the first phase on digital divide. And um, just to sum up quickly the contributions that we had so far uh, from Smita, which highlighted the societal um, influences uh, when it comes to addressing issues specific to gender uh, digital divide. We did have also here how important it is for websites to guarantee uh, accessibility, um, um, you know, to people who are uh, who have uh, limited uh, accessibility issues. Uh, also, the importance of public spaces and libraries uh, generating uh, knowledge and uh, raising awareness about um, uh, specific issues. And finally, uh, the human rights-based approach uh, and the importance of digital rights in uh, crisis. Um, uh, uh, phases like uh, COVID-19. So I invite these uh, panelists, our, our um, esteemed panelists, to write their recommendations so we can uh, pass them on as an outcome of this session later on to the Secretariat. And that brings us to 25 minutes that we dedicated to uh, the first phase of uh, this session on digital divide. And I'm going to uh, give the floor to my colleague, uh, Tatiana, to take the lead on phase two, which will speak to uh, specifically to the fundamental rights and freedoms in uh, the phase of COVID-19. Tatiana, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Hanan. And I also would like to, wrap, to, to provide a bit of additional wrap up to the phase one. Um, uh, there is a question on the Q&A Q and A poll from Amali de Silva Mitchell. I think this one is from from Valencia. Uh, what has been the extent of collaboration between libraries and community social activity centers during COVID? So Valencia, if you have the ability to type the answers, please do. Uh, if not, we can we can come back to this question later because we do have another aspect uh, aspect where coalition of on public on access to in public libraries is going to be included. The second phase we have is actually focused on human rights, fundamental freedoms and protection of, of, of fundamental rights. And we wanted to ask the coalitions who are working in this area, I know that almost any work of any coalition would relate to rights and freedoms to some extent. But some of them are dealing with these issues directly, like, for example, you heard from June intervention, how governments um, and, and, and private industry are dealing with handling and promoting and upholding human rights uh, during COVID pandemic, and they are not always doing well. So um, based on the contribution provided by June, I would like to move here to um, DC on sustainability. Your paper focuses a lot on the post-COVID recovery and and on journalists and what you call what you call infodemics. And I wanted to ask you from your DC perspective, what are the main issues during pandemic and hopefully on the road to recovery? I believe that we have Michael Ogier who is going to speak from this coalition. Michael, you have two minutes. 
Thank you very much, Tatiana. Thank you everyone for, for having us. Um, essentially, there are a few things to, to stress in this particular time. Um, and that is that indeed, uh, journalism at the moment and news media around the world are facing really an extinction level event where according to one survey, for instance, that was just very recently released, um, essentially, even though, um, uh, even though readership has been, uh, audience reach has been up over the past, um, uh, ever since the beginning started, almost 80% of small and independent journalism outlets around the world are reporting a significant drop in revenue. Why is this important and why is this related to internet governance? It really has to deal with the fact that one, um, so much of what is happening online is, uh, uh, as it relates to journalism and news media, me, it mean, uh, includes the fact that um, funding is under threat uh, because of changing av uh, advertising revenues and uh, market, uh, and market uh, dynamics that impact the journalism um, uh, uh, sector. Um, but also there is a, a critical, um, 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 a, a, rather there's a, a critical lack of um, good Something is telling me that we lost Michael, or is it on that me? one thing that we say within our community? Can you hear me? Now, yes. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Basically, one thing that we, we like to say a lot, an axiom that we like to say is that you cannot have press freedom without the press. So one of the things that we're dealing with at the moment is the fact that, but in, in order to actually enable press freedom, we need to have um, uh, sustainable journalism. And that is exactly what I'm trying to, uh, is, is our point that is under threat in part. And we need support from governments, technology organizations, technology companies, advertising um, uh, firms in order to shore up the, uh, uh, the, the sector as a whole. Um, Hanan, I can't say how many minutes, how much time do I have left? Zero. Zero. Oh, thank you. So, so that's a start for now. Uh, I'll be happy to put more. In a bit. <laughs> thank you very much, Michael. And I'm sure that you you can say more if there are any questions. I, I hope there are questions for discussion. I see that Olivia was trying to riot against moderation on the chat. Olivia, you will have the floor, and you are going to speak about digital divide and and connected to fundamental rights building upon what previous speaker says. So we have the floor of the session here, and. Before we go to Olivia, I would like to give the floor to DC on child online protection, because we are talking and thinking a lot about human rights and fundamental freedoms, but there is also a big debate going on about how pandemics actually affect children. So how do we protect them online? What is being done by your coalition and in general? So uh, John, the floor is yours and please let us know your perspective. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. <clears throat> I hope I get a chance to come in and strongly support some of the things that Michael was saying in his uh, previous session because that absolutely raises questions about children and young people's rights. And I just briefly say, you, you sometimes hear it said that professional journalism is not dead. You just have to pay for it now. Well, you know what? I have a number of subscriptions <clears throat> to The Economist, The New Scientist. They cost a lot of money. Children don't and can't pay to hear the truth. Would they rely on professional journalism governed by the ethics of journalism and governed by the laws of libel and slander that have long always governed normal newspaper outputs. And these laws simply do not apply to online platforms, which is where children and young people increasingly get their news from. So this whole question of journalism is a human rights question, and it's a, a human rights question which has particular impact on children. I just want to briefly say, I, I very much agree with what Smith was saying at, at the beginning. What the, what the COVID crisis has revealed is nothing new. It's just put it all on steroids. The number of children calling helplines during the lockdown has gone up by 50%, 60%. Compla uh, the number of children who haven't been able to connect to school remotely in England was 1.34 million 
they didn't have adequate internet connectivity or a device at home that would allow them to do their homework. By the way, the, the, the equivalent figure in the United States is 9 million. So if that's the position in two of the richest countries in the world, you have to wonder what's been happening to children elsewhere uh, in the world in the less affluent countries. Having a mobile phone is no good if you're trying to do your chemistry homework. Having a mobile phone is no good if you're trying to write an essay about war and peace. So, uh, the, so COVID has revealed stuff that we already knew, but it has magnified it and amplified it, if I can borrow uh, the phrase that Smita used in her opening remarks. Thank Lots you, John. Other things. Okay, you have Jim. time to finish the sentence. Thank you. Oh, okay. We'll get back to you. <laughs> Thanks. We're just saving time for discussion. And now I would like to ask Olivier Capan Leblon from Dynamic Coalition on Core Internet Values. Olivier, I know that, that your coalition, the core internet value, basically relate to any anything on the internet. We know that they're different from rights and principles. You heard, we heard these interventions about human rights, fundamental rights, rights of children, journalism and media and, and support. So how can the work related to core internet values support all these and maybe bring these issues together? Is there any chance? Olivier, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Tatiana. Olivier Capanablon speaking. And, you know, I've heard a lot of very sensible uh, points being made here. Uh, the Dynamic Coalition on Core Internet Values focuses primarily on technical issues with regards to the Internet. So the, the core values, the, the technical values on which the Internet was built on, TCP, IP, all of this technical things with the uh, end-to-end uh, -end principle, the uh, Internet being open, uh, being non-discriminatory, etc. And unfortunately, what we're seeing here at present that governments are doing is exactly somehow the opposite of what they should be doing. We, we've heard from so many DCs here that the primary problem is going to be access and access for those children and uh, grown-ups that do not have access to the internet at the moment because the COVID-19 has just brought so much business online and if you're not online you can't have it and instead of doing that governments has been have been or many governments have been focusing on exactly the opposite uh, to the extent that the uh, dynamic coalition on core internet values and a number of other dynamic coalitions have uh, released a statement on internet on excessive internet control which touches on suppression of political dissent because technologically this is something that's being done and that can be done especially with artificial intelligence national firewalls which are now being rolled out for some reason uh, national shutdowns fragmentation of the internet and data prioritization and traffic shaping and we understand there needs to be traffic shaping maybe for some of the new services that come out but when it's being used politically in order to provide um uh, uh, this sort of edge, this competitive edge to the biggest companies out there at the expense of the smaller voices out there, then we really have a problem. And that completely breaks core internet values. So um, that's where we stand at the moment. And uh, several DCs have uh, signed this, the Dynamic Coalition on Core Internet Values, the One on the Internet of Things, the Internet Rights and Principles Coalition and the Youth Coalition on Internet Governance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Olivier, for being so short and on the spot. And this gives us some minutes for discussion and for maybe some of the panelists answering to the interventions of each other. But before we go there, I think that many of the fundamental rights and freedoms problems, and I see on, on the chat as well, we are talking about gender, we are talking about boys and girls, we are talking how gender is affected, and I see that the chat is actually bringing some of the issues. And I want to ask Smita, listening to the first three panelists talking about fundamental rights, protection, core internet values, do you have anything to add here? Hi, yes, thank you. Uh, I think uh, one of the things which we also need to talk about is like what I've put in the chat is one thing that uh, between when you talk about access to education and information, who's prioritized over whom is one question. And another thing is that what happens once you enter the digital space and when you start using technology is another question, right? Um, because one of the things that has happened during COVID-19 is that there is a sudden 
dramatic increase in online gender-based violence. And uh, this needs, and this is, um, you know, you can actually trace it uh, from lockdowns happening in different countries, how online gender-based violence has gone up. Um, but, uh, and, and what this means is that once again, this infringes on fundamental rights um, against discrimination, um, on education, because it is the access to technology by women and girls, which is monitored also. It doesn't matter whether they are the ones who are subjected to violence or no. The fact is that, oh, okay, this is happening to you, so stop using the mobile phone, right? Um, and these are, you know, the nuances of it, which also needs to be spoken about. And uh, finally, um, when we talk about access and, uh, you know, the right to access, what also happens when we talk about access to spaces like the IGF, where we need to have these conversations, right? Um, is it easy access? Is it welcoming of queer persons? Is it welcoming of people who do not speak English or any of the UN languages? Because more people speak Hindi in spaces. Most people, there are a whole bunch of languages which are not in the UN list of languages as well, right? Um, also, when you come here, how easy is it for me to join a panel, right? Am I clicking in five different spaces and then coming here? And what does this do to people who want to talk about this, who have a lot to add. For example, school teachers, um, college professors in small towns, they have a lot to add about this. Uh, journalists in small cities who don't report in English have a lot to add here. But if, you have, if I have to click in five different places just to find a login link, then what happens, right? Are we making access easy? As a queer person, I felt I didn't like the registration form when I had to register for the IGF because after man, woman, Mr., Miss, there was an other. Am I so fluid? Am I so amorphous that it's all under other, right? Um, so I think when we talk about core values, these are some things which we need to reflect on by ourselves and see how we can do better by marginalized communities who we really want to bring in. No one questions the intention, but are we doing the actions required for the same? Um, I'll stop here for now. Thank you. Thank you, Smi. And, and I see John's excellent intervention on the chat. John, do you want to add anything else? Because I see that uh, the, the issue about access, fundamental rights, children rights, gender issues are coming together in this panel. So John, over to you. Well, not much to add to what I said in the chat. Uh, I was very, I was very uh, impressed by Michael's presentation. It's a shame we don't have much longer to talk about it. We've set up systems where apparently we're now expected to pay for the truth. Children can't pay for the truth. So when they go to websites that say the Holocaust never happened, or when they go to websites that tell us uh, <clears throat> that America won the Second World War and the Soviet Union had nothing to do with it, what are we to make of that? That is, that is a human rights question. It's a child protection question. And if the internet governance mechanisms can't address it, then really we're wasting our time. Thank you, John. And actually, we do have time to talk about this because I was cutting you also brutally and because Hanan said <laughs> this time limit. So, Michael, now over to you. Do you think internet governance can address these issues? Yes, actually, absolutely. What One of the things that we have to recognize is that when it comes to journalism sustainability, there are so many cross-cutting issues, as in it's not just one specific group of actors that, that need, need to be included in the conversation in order to drive change. What we really need is concerted multi-stakeholder effort. If anything, that's one of the exact reasons why we need to be here at the IGF, why the IGF can facilitate those kinds of connections, those kinds of Cross pollinate that kind of cross pollination. I often talk about that within environmental sustainability. It's just as much of an issue within journalism sustainability. Um, and one thing that we've done, for instance, earlier this year is we actually released a, an emergency joint appeal um, that was signed by now over 180 different organizations, calling on recommendations from a, for across uh, for stakeholders from across the. Uh, the sectors, um, talking about what they can do. For instance, advertisers and technology organizations need to stop blacklisting certain kind of advertising from uh, journalism um, article or journalistic articles that, for instance, talk about COVID-19. Earlier in the year, a lot of uh, advertisers were, st were d per stopped allowing for, uh, for COVID-19 related uh, um, uh, posts to include their, their branding and their, and, their and their adverts. 
that obviously hurt journalism organizations, even though um, those, uh, you know, that was something that was meant to be, um, that, that, could, that was something that could help support that. So that's a, a, a one instance. But of course, there are, there are so many others to highlight, including the need to, to continue expanding access. That is something that is absolutely uh, critical for, for the um, uptake of journalism and news media, especially in the global south and especially in hard to, to access areas. Um, there is a need to discuss how, um, uh, what, for instance, governments, technology companies can do to help um, facilitate the kinds of uh, support that is needed. I mean, especially financial support and things like that. So there's quite a lot that we can do here. And that's exactly why the DC sustainability thinks that it's so important for journalists and news media actors to be involved in the digital policy discussion, especially that historically we've been um, relatively excluded either on purpose, not necessarily on purpose, but we're making that concerted effort to make our um, community heard. Thank you, Michael. We still have a few minutes left in this session. But, I wanted to ask, John, did you want to say yeah, something? Yeah, Michael, where, where is the vast majority of money that used to pay the advertising that kept journalism going? Where is, it, where is all that money going? It's not going to anybody who's in this session or anybody who's listening to the IGF. And if a government, if a government were to legislate to tell Google and Facebook to give money to support professional journalism, what would you say? That the government, it's got nothing to do with governments. I would say, I would say that we do need um, significant market um, based mechanisms for, for how to address this because you know, it, there is a clear imbalance between what publishers and whatnot, what their what publishers, journalism organizations, what they're dealing with at the moment, and then what especially large um, technology companies without naming any names per se, um, are now um, reaping the benefits of that. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, of interesting regulation and a lot of interesting developments happening in Australia, now within the EU and also within the US. I don't mean to just highlight Northern examples, but, uh, but, but those specific examples are where there's a lot, well, I don't, uh, where a lot of, of this conversation is being driven. Um, and I would say that, uh, um, I mean, it's, I really don't see, um, of course I welcome dialogue, but I don't really see any significant changes happening without more Michael, Michael, M Michael, you did, you did see that Facebook threatened to withdraw all of its services from Australia if they, if they promised to go ahead with, with those laws. So, you know, we, we, we need to be realistic about this. Two or three small companies are doing all the damage and they are not involved in this discussion. Uh, hello, dear panelists. I'm going to wrap up this discussion right now. And Mariana, actually, you got it right on the chat. I was going to give a floor. We still have a couple of minutes left to DC on human rights and principles. And yeah. I was going to call either Mariana or Minda or somebody, please, the floor is yours for the next two minutes. June, is that okay? Just checking with June, is that okay? Just, we haven't queued ourselves offline. Thank you very much, I only have, yes. Uh, this issue around right to access to the internet, um, as Michael quite rightly, oh, start my video, sorry. Hi. As Michael quite rightly says, these are cross-cutting issues and why this DC main session is so important underscores how cross-cutting the issues are. Access is more than pushing a button. Access is more than entering your details. Access begins once you've entered your detail. The other A word is availability. And Michael's underscoring the fact that we have less and less availability of rich, diverse forms of information. And the Charter of Human Rights and Principles for the Internet, which is 10 years old, underscores this within its Article 6 freedom of expression by including the right to information. A five-year-old has a right to information as that's um, laid out by um, um, UN charters and our covenants. So this is what the problem is. And we know that governments are reneging on their actual uh, human rights obligations by allowing private sector actors to provide emergency provisions and using the pandemic as a cloak. And this must stop and we must be much firmer and much clearer with our request to our governments to comply with their own human rights standards and intervene in ways that they only they can by um, avoiding the private sector domination of all forms of information. And finally, 
that with information comes dismiss, skewed information, with all this availability becomes difference, diversity, contradictions. It's not about all saying the same thing at the same time. It's about being able to discern the difference between rubbish, better rubbish, worse rubbish, truth, fact, fiction, and all the rest. And that's the concern. I don't want us to get locked into some sort of um, either or uh, situation. We have to allow diverse information and let the people who want to spread lies, spread the lies, but come back with truths, our own truths, substantiated truths, and the internet can provide this, but our governments really have to step up to the mark. I'm getting increasingly impatient. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mariana. And with this, and, and, and this is basically a perfect wrap up for this session on fundamental rights and freedoms, because you made the point which leads us to the phase three about awareness, about education and empowerment. And I will give the, the floor back to Hanan, who will moderate the next phase of this session. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tatiana, and all the uh, speakers uh, about the passionate you know, plea. Uh, we do have uh, various contributions which touch closely on the key you know, issues that we're facing um, you know, uh, as humans and as internet users. So yeah, the, the role of the media is very important. And that takes me to uh, flip, you know, the coin and take us to another important segment of the society. Um, and that speaks to, you know, the, the, the next uh, phase of this uh, session and specifically the role of youth when it comes to how they have been, uh, you know, uh, tackling uh, the uh, the issue of digital inclusion in, in the era of uh, COVID-19. And I'm really intrigued to invite Gustav to this conversation so he can uh, take us through, you know, what is the uh, other side of the coin, you know, of, uh, of, of um, you know, this pandemic and from the perspective of, uh, of the youth. So Gustav is representing the uh, coalition uh, of uh, youth in the uh, IGF. Gustav, um, I'm not sure if you can hear me. Hello, I'm already, I already have my time here. Thank you. Um, I, I first, I have to agree with all the points presented before. Um, if anything, I would, uh, I would really highlight that maybe a way to summarize what was discussed so far is that the COVID pandemic potentialized pre-existing inequalities across the board, all of them economic inequalities, uh, even in age and even in access, mainly in access. And not only that, when it comes to the youth in education in particular, political issues, uh, national political issues, uh, uh, election issues took precedence over the essential things that you know, are important to our youth, to our education. Uh, basically, the youth became absolutely secondary. Uh, the whole new, the whole next generation became completely secondary to all these political issues going on around the world. Uh, mainly, and we can see this in elections even today. Not only that, one of the things we we identified in a workshop in the Brazilian IGF is that going forward, internet governance, as in the under the holistic understanding of what the internet is and the role it has in society and in the professional world is no longer something which people cannot know. It is becoming increasingly pressing that educating people about what the internet is, how it works, and even platforms and all these issues we're facing with this information. This is necessary. This is necessary in universities, in basic education. This is no longer something which we can keep in a specific all across the globe and even in families this is this is going forward an essential life skill thank you thank you very much uh, Gustav uh, very, very good point uh, indeed um, and I would like to uh, maybe uh, address uh, the same question to uh, Christopher Yu uh, so Christopher is is uh, representing uh, the DC of connecting the unconnected and um, I think you you through your paper that I've read, you played a key role uh, during the pandemic uh, addressing uh, key issues that uh, have risen uh, due to COVID-19, especially in the health uh, sector. So you might want to share with us, you know, um, the, what role did you play uh, in your DC specifically in terms of raising awareness 
uh, educating you know, the authorities about the needs of citizens. Sorry, I have Please. to promote Chris to panelists. So she, 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 oh, he has to be here in in a minute. Chris, I hope that you can unmute yourself now. So, Chris, Christopher, I, I'm not sure if you you were able to uh, hear me, and I hope you are. I hope your, your transition is smooth to the panelists' list. Hi, Christopher. We can't hear you. you. You're muted, so um, I don't think we can hear you. Uh, you unfortunately, your voice is not coming. Uh, at least to me, I, I don't. I can't hear you. Um, so maybe we can. Uh, you can sort out a technical issue with the microphone, and we'll we'll come back to you. But we would like to hear more of the work that you're doing in your uh, dynamic coalition with regards to raising awareness uh, on uh, specific issues. Um, I, I have uh, to go back now to Jerry. Uh, Jerry, so I know that you're doing a lot of uh, the work um, on the ground. Uh, meanwhile, Christopher is, is back. Jerry, if you, if you would like maybe to take us through your efforts, you know, to raise awareness and uh, play your educational card uh, when it comes to uh, addressing digital inclusion uh, issues. Thank you. Um, one of the things that we want to raise awareness is that we're not the only people who are saying the, uh, that inclusion of people with disabilities is good for society. All of, all of society is saying that. And I want to give some examples of that. The UN General Secretary <clears throat> Antonio Guterres launched the UN Disability Inclusion Strategy in 2019. He stated, when we remove policies or obstacles for opportunities for people with disabilities, the whole world benefits. Accenture, report, uh, Accenture launched a report in December 2018 called, uh, called, let me just check the name, Getting to Equal. And what that showed was the economic benefits to organizations of including people with disabilities as employees and making their products accessible to, uh, to society in general. There's an economic benefit to those organizations. Of course, there's the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Of course, people with disabilities are mentioned seven times in the Sustainable Development Goals. The roadmap to equality and, e and sustainability includes the 1.3 billion people with disability, but it is of benefit to all of society. And that's one of the main things that we're raising. Let me give you a small example just before we go. This, this um, IGF that we're attending, there are hundreds of sessions. And if, that was, if you were trying to watch all those on video to get an idea of what's going on, it would take you three years, two years, who knows? But because there are captioning there, which were originally done for people who are deaf, you can now search through those. You can do uh, automated searches. You can search for poor, uh, all, uh, uh, common themes through different things much more easily. That benefits everyone, not just people with disabilities. I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you very much, uh, Jerry. And I'm gonna go back to Christopher, who is uh, up and running, I think. and. Uh... We would like to hear uh, from you on, on the role you're playing in terms of uh, raising awareness um, with the communities that you're working with. Hi, Christopher, it's good to see you. So uh, the floor is yours. Can you hear me now? Loud and clear. Terrific. Well, thank you very much. We are delighted to be here representing the Dynamic Coalition on Innovative Approaches to Connecting the Unconnected. Um, uh, we uh, uh, continue our work trying to gather to try to avoid reinventing the wheel, to learn from uh, the wonderful work that people are doing all over the world, but are convinced that uh, unfortunately, very little information or data is collected on their successes or failures, which means that everyone is pretty much starting from scratch. And unfortunately also, what little data is being collected does not allow for cross-project comparisons. Uh, the heart of the work is a database we've amassed of over 1,100 uh, innovative ways to connect people to the internet, both on by increasing connectivity, but also of overcoming demand side obstacles such as digital literacy and the like. 
uh, and um, gender uh, disability access, as Jerry mentions, uh, senior access, uh, any one of a number of dimensions. We then reached out to all 1,100 of the uh, initiatives we identified and have now conducted case study interviews with everyone who consented there in 125. All these are available on oneworldconnected.org. And we're trying to create an information base that will help uh, to uh, give insights to people all over the world, give uh, new ideas about new attempt ways to try, but also information on what's working and what's not working. Because many people, uh, what you'll find is published are too busy. The people who are doing this in the field don't have time to document what they're doing. And uh, what is documented often is perceived success stories without much uh, attention to failure stories. And there can be as important for learning from project to project as anything. Um, based on my understanding of this meeting, and I apologize if I got the time wrong because I thought that I was joining just before it began. Um, uh, they, um, I was asked to, to, to address in particular uh, issue surrounding education, uh, which has been one of the focuses of, of the Dynamic Coalition's work. In fact, um, we participated in two major international efforts. One is GIGA, the initiative to connect every school convened by UNICEF and the International Telecommunications Union. And the educate, there was a project uh, but led by uh, Tim Unwin, a professor in the UK and the EdTech Hub called Education for the Most Marginalized po in the, uh, Post COVID-19. And what we've really learned for, as a wonderful case study of the importance of the work that the IGF is doing is that uh, the internet connectivity is critical. Uh, if that's never been, anyone who has school-aged children or involved in education has become aware that the pandemic really uh, threw a huge spotlight on the necessity of internet connectivity. Uh, and uh, it's, a fantastic, it's a really wonderful chance to understand its importance. And what we've learned among other things is that uh, the pandemic has actually exacerbated learning inequalities. Uh, the Kenya, the, in July, Kenya candidly admitted that they had lost the academic year and has conceded that they will reopen in 2021 but had no real way to effectively uh, conduct education for its students for most of that year. Uh, so there are alarming problems, but at the same time, we've seen a number of very innovative responses and solutions, which have been tremendous. It's a wonderful chance to learn, a wonderful chance to try new things and uh, mother necessity being the mother of invention. What you see is an outpouring of really fascinating efforts to expand internet connectivity with the urgency of, of the need to educate people. Uh, many joint efforts with the private sector, with initiatives being launched all over the world. Uh, but for example, in South Africa alone, uh, they allocated additional spectrum to wireless broadband. Uh, they provided sub they subsidized data, provided data, laptops, uh, tablets to make this possible. And a very common phenomenon all over the world, South Africa zero rated educational content to make it easier to access. And these were all very interesting, innovative responses that we thought was incredibly beneficial. Um, interestingly, also, we learned that there are a number of prerequisites for uh, uh, delivering education online. Uh, there's a bunch of, the, the easiest one for all of us to understand is the necessity of, of, of internet connectivity uh, for students. And so we, uh, first it has to exist, it also has to be affordable. Uh, but we also learned that quality matters a great deal. Uh, we see in the, in the middle of the pandemic, uh, because of the multiple uses, there was a spike in usage and that would cause slowdowns in a number of countries. And that in fact, we saw even countries with connectivity, uh, the story that sticks with me most vividly is Italy. Uh, they have a good base level connectivity, but not enough to support the video learning, the submission yeah. of, of, of assignments and the like that really brought things down. Thank you, Christopher. I don't want to. I don't mean to cut you. Uh, I think you're doing really great work, and I invite everybody to read your substantive paper, which is uploaded on the IGF website. But I'll have to cut you because there is another aspect that I really want to touch upon before we wrap up. You know this phase and see um, a few questions, and I invite people to keep an eye on the chat window because there is a very interesting. Uh, discussion and input consistently and constantly added by the panelists and uh, the different participants that we have. We also have three questions, uh, and I, I, I hope I hope we answered a few of them, you know, through uh, the different interventions that we have. But the last item I have on my agenda here, 
speaks to the role of empowerment, which we know empowering people to join the conversation on angel governance, integrating international policy processes is not easy. So we thought that um, having our work uh, done online will help uh, include more people in important key uh, policy processes. Uh, but I think uh, maybe one panelist, I will have to turn to Stuart to speak to this specific issue and maybe Gustav, if, if he has any uh, anything to add to uh, how do we empower least represented communities in uh, processes such as uh, internet governance um, so we can have actually a clear view of what's at stake exactly. So uh, Stuart, um, maybe. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, I've got to confess that I was ready to talk about libraries and research and learning. Um, but I mean, I think libraries can play a, a good role through um, the connectivity that we offer to allow people to take part in internet governance debates. But you know, there are there are some things that you know people need if they're going to be able to to participate accurately in this. And that, of course, is is the sort of skills that come with a good education. And that's where we've been trying to do our best during the pandemic to make use of library facilities and extend online education whilst the doors of places like libraries are closed. So actually, I, I wanted to point out a couple of things which I think are important for the overall debate, which really do cover that context of, uh, of engagement. Um, we've seen a tremendous amount of um, use of digital library resources by all user groups, which I think bodes well for engagement. There might be a, an idea that it's only younger people who are diving into sort of eBooks and e-audio books, but we've seen that across the board in sort of older folk and Valencia has also mentioned that in her intervention. But we've seen this big shift to online education, online research and learning, which Christopher was alluding to as well. And it's there that I actually want to point out some things which I think we need to keep a very close eye on as we're going forward, uh, because there are problems. Uh, and some of these problems are around the licensing environments for the sorts of information that libraries make available. Um, limits on the number of simultaneous users that people uh, can, can access textbooks, ebooks, restrictions on lending information between libraries across countries, and restrictions on text and data mining, which is extremely important because access to knowledge is, a, is very much in a pandemic a public health issue. There are major issues around the costs of things like electronic textbooks. I'm going to place a link in the chat in a moment, which will let you see the massive differences between a cost of a print book and an electronic book. And then there's huge issues around copyright. Um, if you think about a situation where lecturers are telling people that they, it would be much better if they just went and got a Netflix subscription because they don't have the copyright conditions to let media studies courses take place. This is, this is something which we really need to be careful on. So in terms of what we want in policy recommendations, we need clarity on the exceptions and limitations that we can use for online education and the things that libraries can provide. We need an investigation into ebook pricing, which is quite frankly scandalous, and we need more options to be able to purchase them. And there's something which we haven't touched upon, which is device poverty. We've talked about connectivity. We need to talk about device poverty in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Stuart. And I, I think knowledge is power, and the educational aspect um, is also equally uh, important in uh, the, the issue of empowerment. And I do have uh, two hands, I think, uh, yeah. by two panelists that we have, and they can speak to probably the issue of integrating minorities and voices in decision-making processes. And I'm going to give the floor to uh, Muhammad um, and then Smita to reflect on these uh, on this specific point. So Muhammad, if you can um, hear me. Uh, so the question speaks to the role of uh, empowerment of minorities or communities that are not represented properly in policy process. Yes. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, my apologies for you not being able to see me because uh, I have a wonky internet connection. So uh, I, I would really apologize for that. So you'll have to rely on my voice. Uh, I would like to say uh, two or three points here with regards to inclusion and awareness and particularly about the empowerment. Uh, we have to have 
uh, if we want to make people empowered, we need we need to bring relevant communities as we people with disabilities like to say nothing about us without us. If, if you want to if you want to have a discussion about person with disabilities, you need to bring people with disabilities actual onto the table for having these kind of discussions about uh, their issues. Uh, with regards to that uh, dynamic relation on accessibility and disability this year, uh, since we uh, were hearing that this ITF is going to go online, we, uh, thanks to a, a grant from uh, Google and WinServe, uh, we supported uh, people with disabilities uh, of, with regards to internet connectivity. We provided uh, fellowships to pro to uh, enable people with disabilities uh, with regards to accessing the internet and uh, uh, availing the opportunity to attend IGF. We also uh, organized a hub in Hagi to uh, person with disabilities, which were also uh, supported by the grant uh, provided by uh, Google and WinSurf. So thanks, uh, heads off to that. Uh, we would also uh, provide some travel grants if the next year IGF goes uh, back to uh, in-person participation, there would be some travel funds as well. Thank but you very much. Not, thank we would, you. We would thank you. Thank you. Sorry to cut you. Um, your two minutes is up, but uh, you made some concrete suggestions on how to include, um, to, to basically guarantee more inclusion in general. And we would like to receive your contribution um, specific recommendation in writing so we can put it forward. And I'll give the floor to Smita because I know she'll definitely have something to say about uh, empowerment of uh, minorities in general. Uh -huh. Hi, <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, I think one of the things that we really need in terms of uh, bringing in more people to these conversations, one thing which uh, I, I have two points to make. One is that I think one of the reasons why uh, people may feel a little distant from conversations around IGF and um, similar spaces, policy spaces, is because they cannot connect it to their ground realities, right? If you cannot connect with people on what is actually happening to them, if you cannot convey why these policies matter to them in an everyday life, why will they care about it, right? Until we get people to care, policies and guidelines, all of these would just remain words in the cloud, pun intended. And uh, second thing is that in a lot of conversations, what happens especially with regards to marginalized communities um, and women and other gender and sexual minorities, persons with disability, um, those who don't speak English, all of this is that we constantly remain in this crisis intervention mode. Like we talk about uh, these issues only when problems arise. Gender came into IGF spaces only because online violence grew to the point where you couldn't ignore it. And there were people much more smarter and wiser than me who spoke about it and made an initiative to bring it to internet governance spaces. But we cannot continue and to talk in only violence-centric conversations, right? You need pleasure, you need access um, to digital spaces and technology for fun. You need access to it so that you can do what you want in these spaces, right? And policies need to support this. I don't want a policy only to protect me. I want a policy which will allow me to have fun, right? And the demands for this from marginalized communities come in a form of, it's almost like an audacity to demand equality, right? And this equality to loiter on online spaces, the equality to participate in policy and bring up um, you know, topics that are relevant to you, which may affect my access tomorrow. And I think that is the way we can actually bring in more people. Thank, Thank you, you very you. much, Luda. Very uh, concrete uh, suggestions and uh, inputs as usual. Thank you very much. and. Uh, I think with that, I am going to wrap up uh, the uh, section on uh, empowerment and education. And we will have to spend the last 20 minutes of this session talking about the future of the IGF and the contribution of the DCs. Um, uh, so Tatiana will be uh, moderating that specific phase. I just want to say something. The last note is it is very important that at this point, uh, the uh, IGF works on cross-fertilization of ideas between the different um, segments that are not represented. And I've uh, received information yesterday that the uh, high level uh, round table, uh, which included parliamentarians would like to collaborate with the DCs. And I think this is good news.
because then you can actually work with various MPs on specific issues to advocate on whatever at stake on the ground, on the floor to make sure that your voice is heard. And with that, I will pass uh, the floor to Tatiana. Uh, thank you, Hanan. And as you said, we want to ensure that all the voices are heard. And I know that Gustavo wanted to make the last point about the, the previous phase. So Gustavo, I will give you two minutes. I know that you watch the time, so please do. So we'll, we, we will make sure yes. that it's early. <laughs> I will be very brief. Um, on the topic of empowerment, I think that there are many ways to approach this, especially when we talk about the youth. Many of the young people who come to governance spaces, they come from other industries. They come from, uh, from economic, from activities which already are closely tied to internet policy making. So for them, it's only about a matter of briefly learning about the topic and then just jumping in. For other youth who want to, but these people, these young people, they often do not have continued engagement. They come and go. If we want to create continued engagement, especially from youth or people, people in general, not only youth, but other underrepresented people, such as LGBT people, we need to, we need to address the fact that for many professionals, continued engagement in internet governance is just not feasible. Uh, there are very few incentives in the terms of how it applies to their economic activity. And we, as in the internet governance community, we benefit immensely from extremely hardworking volunteers, especially from civil society, but it is an uphill battle. And this, this kind of continued engagement is just a gigantic barrier, especially for young people and for people from the global South. It is, it is when, when you have so many other professional obligations, when just making enough to live by is so difficult, it is very difficult to justify the kind, this kind of engagement with global policy making. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gustavo, and thank you for building yet another bridge from our previous discussion to the, the, the wrapping up phase of this session. And we are going to talk about the future of the IGF. What can the IGF community do to make these, the IGF a catalyst, a cause for these quantum changes during pandemic and post-pandemic? And is, is IGF doing enough? And I would like, we have two speakers in my mind for this session, uh, for this phase of the session. And I would like to actually, we, we wrapped up the previous one with youth. And I would like to give the floor to another speaker from youth, to Aileen. Aileen, what is your take on this? What is the future of the IGF in this regard? Thank you very much, Tatiana. I'm going to be as short as possible. Uh, so from the Youth Coalition, uh, we have been uh, seeing that the current situation is that the disease have been a key player in the internet governance ecosystem. We have been discussing on the most pressing issues, especially from the Youth Coalition, where we have put the topic of the table of which is the role that we have as youth uh, we, and how we want to play it and to gain more visibility, empowering the next generation of leaders within the IGF uh, IG environment. A good example of this is how we have been uh, working closely with the Internet Society uh, to build a mentorship training uh, for the Internet Society's IGF Youth Ambassadors of this year because we believe that we need more voices that can um, to give more voices who can give a proper treatment of the topics that matter to us in forums like the IGF. This has been part of our efforts targeting youth and participating at the youth engagement strategy. For the future within Dynamic Coalition, we shall address the importance of highlighting the intersectional work, as this has been happening with the BPFs. They may not get enough recognition, though most of the discussion is concentrated at the NRI development in the IG space. But I would like to bring to this excellent panel the future application of the IGF Plus model. It is a model which has been highly, highly recommended through the community, the UN High Level Panel on Digital Cooperation, and especially at the Stakeholders Dialogue and Global Citizens Dialogue organized by Missions Full Case this year. The dynamic coalitions 
and other parts of the IGF intersectional work should be the basis to strengthen internet in the terms of digital cooperation. As you should have remarked, we have um, participated at the IGF Plus survey uh, on behalf of the YSIG. In addition, we shall promote the co collaboration among dynamic coalitions. This year, we have collaborated with the statement on excessive internet controls that my colleague Oliver has mentioned before. And we have also participated at one of the sessions uh, organized by the Internal Rights and Principles Coalition. Uh, these examples show us the work of dynamic coalition that should become more relevant than ever. We are part of a larger community willing to contribute to the improvement of the IGF towards the future. Finally, I would like to remark that it's essential to have representation of youth, including youth, youth parliamentarians at the IGF intersectional activities. As youth, we shall decide in our future and encourage stakeholders to avoid tokenism of youth. We are here to address the matters we care about. Our voice should be heard and taken into consideration to shape the future of the IGF and the internet governance space in general. Thank you. I hope I... Thank you. Thank time. you very much, Aileen. Uh, it's very nice to see youth being so active in all these processes. And I would like to give the floor to Olivier Crepin Leblon because I do believe that, in a way, the dynamic coalition on core internet values can, uh, can tell us how core internet values contribute to all these quantum changes. Olivier, you have 20 minutes to add some, sorry, 20 seconds. 20 seconds to add something to youth. Oh dear, oh dear, Tatiana, you're so tough. 20 minutes would have been just barely enough. No, um, I, I'm, I'm not gonna purport to say that it's only the dynamic coalitions on core internet values that, that, that has got all the answers. In fact, I think what this session is showing is that every coalition has got a different angle covered and covered extremely well. And as Eileen just mentioned, I'm not gonna have to repeat what Eileen said, but what I can say though is the future of the IGF has got the core internet, uh, um, sorry, the, the dynamic coalitions in its real core. It's vitally important that this intersessional work continues. And that's only possible with the help of you, the people that are watching this at the moment, the audience that are here, because the vibrancy of, uh, of uh, dynamic coalitions is only there because of the people that make it. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much, Olivia. And I would like to remind us all because I can see how many people are attending right now. And we had we have 103 people in this room. And I hope that you're all enjoying this session. We still have a couple of minutes to, to, to wrap up this phase, which was pretty short for this very big issue on the future of the IGF. So if any of the dynamic coalitions want to speak to this, yes, Jerry, please go ahead. Thank you. The, uh, the people with disabilities want to be involved, want to be included, and are to a large extent included. But some things that we can do, DCAD made available uh, some standards on making meetings accessible. So we'd say, please look at those. We'd say, please look at make, improving the website. I know it's going to be re rebuilt. Please include our needs in those. But as we get away from COVID-19 and we move back towards physical access and hopefully Poland next year. There is a recognition or there needs to be a recognition that it costs usually a lot more for people with disabilities to attend because of inaccessible transport, inaccessible hotels, inaccessible physical buildings where the meetings are held. I know IGF itself doesn't have funds, but ho hopefully you'll work with us to find funders to help support people coming from particularly poorer areas of the, of the world to have their, their, their uh, to have themselves heard. Um, keep in mind, please, the, the, uh, the basic saying of people with, uh, with disabilities, nothing about us without us. Consult us, talk with us, we'll help you, you can help us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jerry. And I have two more people with them. I'm going to close the queue. Yuta, you go first, and then we have Marianne. Please be brief, then I will get it back to Hanan for the wrap up. Thank you. Yuta, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, Tatiana, for giving me the floor. Jutta Kroll, I'm not speaking on behalf of the dynamic solution I belong to, but uh, as the co-facilitator for all the dynamic coalitions. And I'm really grateful for the richness of this debate. I've seen a lot of uh, points that will bring us forward into uh, the future, not only post pandemic, but also considering how intersessional work will be done by dynamic coalitions in the IGF plus model that was uh, suggested by the HLPDC. And uh, if I can report back also from the round table of parliamentarians, it's, it's not only the round table itself, but all the parliamentarians that took part in that session yesterday really had a great interest, interest in working with dynamic coalitions intersessional between the internet governance forums. So it, it, we have achieved to arouse their interest in that uh, during the IGF in Berlin last year. And I would really suggest to pick up on that, that all dynamic coalitions have a look out for parliamentarians who can work with them and also bring their work forward because that is the major step forward for all of us. Thank you so much for this session. Thank you so much, Jutta, and thank you for all the work you do to facilitate this, this, this work of the Dynamic Coalition and, and, and everything that you did for the preparation of this session. Uh, Mariana, uh, we are going to wrap up this, this phase with you, so please, no, with your, your contribution, so please go ahead. Thank you very briefly. Um, I just want to underscore the comment that Minda has just added to the chat, and also that Article 1, right to access to the internet of the Charter of Human Rights and Principles for the Internet starts with 1A, quality of service. The quality of service to which people are entitled access shall evolve in line with advancing technological possibilities. I do not believe the quality of service is evolving in line with advancing technological possibilities. So I think um, we have a serious task ahead of us, and this is why the IGF has proven its worth. And, and also, Olivia, finally, I just like a huge call out, a thank you to everyone here who puts all their additional time, their weekends, their sleeping time. June gets up at three and four in the morning to be part of this. Uh, I just want to say all this is voluntary, unpaid and underpaid and underrecognized labor. And we need to start noticing that because our time is also money and we're devoting our time and money to this process. So I want to thank everyone for all their time and all the extra hours they're doing have done that includes you Jutta and the organizing committee for this DC main session and our professional paid um, support teams as well and let's give the IGF more money more resources and more grunt because we make it so show us what you're worth and put your money where your mouth is governments private sector technical communities and anyone with any money and give it to us without strings attached otherwise you're not worth your salt thank you uh, thank you very much, Mariana. And I want to tell that the the number of attendees is raising. So there are 107 people who heard your intervention. And with this, I'm going to give it back to Hanan for the wrap up. Hanan, it's yours now. Thank you very much, uh, Tatiana. Thank you uh, to all the panelists and the, the vibrant attendees of the session who made the, the discussion really interesting. It's, uh, we're lucky that we have a transcript and I think we can always go back to uh, look at all uh, the contributions uh, across the board, you know, throughout uh, the whole uh, of the phases, you know, that we uh, had during this session. Uh, so we can actually um, have a concise, um, you know, uh, summary of all the recommendations and also I would like to thank uh, the, uh, what do you call that? The godfather and the godmother of the intersessional work specific to the DC work. And that is uh, Marcus Comer and Juta for the encouragement and uh, all the work that is being uh, done by uh, the DCs themselves. I know what it takes because I co-chaired one of them and I, I understand inside out uh, how they can influence um, policy making processes uh, in various contexts. So I would encourage people to uh, choose the topic that is close to their heart and join uh, the DC work because it speaks to the heart, to the core of the issues that we uh, tackle in the IG uh, debate. And there is a little bit uh, of everything for everyone. Uh, so, um, and, and, you know, uh, for, for the people who are asking how to join the 
the DCs, um, I invite you to check the internet governance uh, website secretariat. Uh, there is a mailing list for each DC and uh, you can uh, actually choose uh, which one that speaks to you most so you can join uh, the work. It's unpaid work, it's voluntary, uh, it feeds usually to the full-time job of each one of us somehow. Um, just to underscore that none of us is paid, we're just doing this because we love what we're doing, we would like to contribute to uh, enriching the agenda of the IGF and make it more substantive and meaningful. And I guess the sum up of this session you know, speaks to us all. We know that youth has a role to play. Uh, we need to be more inclusive when it comes to uh, representing, um, making sure that every segment of the society is actually represented. COVID-19 pandemic uh, made us all realize that the internet is so crucial. Now, everybody who is not compelled or convinced, you know, that the internet can play actually a key role uh, in advancing, you know, societies and economies, and now is the time that they understand that. Having said that, we all also realize how the pandemic actually widened the gap, you know, whether it's gender digital gap, uh, disabilities gaps. So we need to be wary. We need to address, you know, these issues to make sure that nobody is left behind, that we are actually um, practicing what we're preaching. And that is very important. And I hope this platform uh, has been, um, you know, uh, important, you know, to call out all the decision makers and policy makers to uh, take into account and be accountable also to the feedback we're receiving from uh, communities uh, all around the world. I have to say this is one of the most active sessions I've ever uh, moderated or contributed to, and that's thanks to the rich discussion that we had so far. I invite, you know, the attendees to also read the substantive papers that were submitted by the DCs because they actually zoom in to these issues that we're trying to um, uh, speak to, you know, at a high level. And that's what we do usually in these kinds of panels. So maybe we don't have the silver bullet, you know, that kind of, um, let's say, concrete solution to solve things, but this is a process. And I think a lot of people on this call understand what does it mean to be involved in the IGF, uh, for so many years, like at least two decades now, we're doing this and we're doing it for a reason. We can see the impact. We can see how we manage finally to include actually more segments from, uh, you know, parliamentarians to youth into the discussion. And um, I hope you enjoyed the session as much as I did. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you to the interpreters. Thank you, Tatiana. Uh, Marcus uh, Jutta for your uh, support to the work of DCs and uh, thank you to all the panelists and uh, I think uh, that's all from me today. Uh, thank you very much and uh, goodbye. Thank you, goodbye all. Thanks to you both, wonderful moderation. Thank you so Thanks much. To everyone and to the sign language interpreters and captioners. Yes, yes to the captions of sound, sign language interpreters. Wonderful session. Have a good day. Have a good Thank day. You, everybody. Oh, Bye. Thank you Bye. very much, Tatiana. Oh, excellent. Oh. excellent. Bye. Hello, for Shin. Ciao. Yes. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.